Hello, everyone. I know you could hear us before, but now you can hear us officially. Welcome to the Say It Loud exhibit and uh, panel discussion, uh, which uh, we are doing in collaboration with the uh, UNLV School of Architecture. Thank you, Stefan. And without uh, waiting any longer, Stefan, I will call on you to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Thank you so much, Randy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for connecting with us tonight and for Say It Loud Nevada joining us. This event is a collaboration between the AIA Las Vegas and the UNLB School of Architecture. I'm based here as professor of architecture at UNLV in, in Las Vegas, member of the AIA Las Vegas Board of Directors. I believe we are witnessing a very important event tonight that consists of three parts. First, we have the opening of the Say It Loud Nevada virtual exhibition, and then we will hear from Pascal Sablan, AIA New York, on her activism and work, and Pascal has interwoven those two things into one. <laughs> Very clever. And finally, we will have an open panel discussion with five esteemed local panelists, and the floor will be open for questions from the online audience. You can send in your questions via the chat box. So please take advantage of the chat box. The panel discussion is an important part. It will explore the meaning of the exhibit and how the profession of architecture can become more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. When we originally initiated the Say It Loud exhibition and lecture by Pascal October last year, one year ago, some time before the tragic events like the death of George Floyd and other terrible incidents that happened um, earlier this year. Pascal's lecture was originally scheduled to be hosted at UNLV on April 20th and to postpone it and move it online due to the pandemic. So this uh, was a year in the pipeline. In the meantime, the Black Matters movement gained enormous momentum. Issues of systemic racism have been brought to the fore. What bothered me last year when we started planning this event was that 50% of our architecture students are female. However, only 28 of licensed architects in the US are female. So there was a mismatch of this discrepancy. The other figure that didn't seem right was that only 2% of all licensed architects in the U US are African American. And it's a number that hasn't changed much since 1960. However, 13% of the total population in the US are African Americans. It's another mismatch. So how does this all make sense or not make sense? What's going on? These developments, today's opening of the exhibition Say It Loud, a lecture by Pascal and following panel discussion is even more timely and relevant than we ever uh, expected. The discussions about racial injustice and equality are reflected back into the university, into the AIA Las Vegas, and universities should be the epicenter of, the, of these topics. As a consequence, U.S. institutions of higher education are now having these difficult discussions. However, we see universities treating this topic very differently. There are also many good developments. I would like to briefly mention AIA Las Vegas has an equity, diversity, and inclusion task force. Uh, the National Organization of Minority Architects is creating a lot of momentum, but are we doing enough? I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Pascal Sablan to the online community. Pascal Sablan AI is a senior associate at Align Architecture, founder and director of Beyond the Built Environment, positioned uniquely to address inequitable disparities in architecture providing a holistic platform. Pascal holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Pratt and a Master of Science in Advanced Architectural Design from Columbia. She will lead us through the Say It Loud exhibit, explore the challenges of women and minorities to career advancement, including finding jobs, attaining equitable pay, and being promoted to senior positions. Please welcome Pascal. Hello, everyone. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. 
All right. Are we seeing it okay? Yes. Wonderful. Good day, everyone. My name is Pascal Sablon, Senior Associate at S9 Architecture. Uh, NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects. I'm the Northeast Regional Vice President, and I'm also their historian. I'm on the AIA New York Board of Directors and AIA New York, oh no, AIA National Strategic Planning Committee member who helped uh, draft and create the strategic plan that the organization will use for the next five years to plan their priorities and the organization, their programs accordingly. I'm also the Board of Trustees at the Mary Lewis Academy and Founder and Executive Director of Beyond the Built Environment. Um, and so I, I, I talk about all these hats that I wear <laughs> so that I can speak to you about all these organizations that I engage and how I try to leverage my, my values in those rooms to make policy changes and to make sure that I fight for a just, uh, equitable, diverse, and inclusive profession and world. And one of my favorite things to do is to volunteer with you these organizations, whether that be AIA K through 12 program or uh, NOMA's project pipeline, where we really get to engage young kids who may not have been introduced to architecture um, more specifically and talk to them about the profession and how they can change the world. And as we spend the day getting them excited, teaching the vernacular, teaching them about architecture, um, we walk, they walk away excited and proud. And I often wonder what happens when those kids go home and Google the word architect. So if one Googles uh, great architects, a Google banner comes up with 50 names and faces. Um, and there was something very shocking or striking about the, the resultant of that list or that search. On your screen here are the first uh, 40 of that 50. And in this, how many do you think are women? One. One. How many are African American? One. Zero. We have nine minorities. Zaha is clutch. <laughs> she holds it down in two, two categories here. But if you look at this list, this really ranges from contemporary architects all the way down to architects Michelangelo and Raphael. So the statement or the search or the result or the message of this result is saying there has only been one woman who has had a significant contribution to the, the environment and no African-Americans from, from now to when architects from Ninja Turtles. And that's just absolutely not true. So on your screen, a great print screen moment is uh, first 40 um, or uh, 40 names of African-American architects who've done prolific work, both contemporary and historical names here. And it's important that I share this with you and I share these names because if I don't share, when will this come up to you? So I went to Google's headquarters, which happens to be in New York, and I said, hey Google, why is this the result when I press this button? And they said, honestly, Pascal, there's not enough content out there that lists you all as great. There's not enough content out there that lists you all about architecture. So that became the first thing that I needed to understand is this is a challenge where we need to elevate the contributions of us beyond just within the profession, but actually um, globally. And what you'll notice about this presentation today is that I kind of set up the issue or the idea of the thing that I'm trying to solve with black and white pages. The yellow pages are the things that I specifically have done to try to address that issue. And then the cyan pages, my favorite color, are what I'm still aspiring to do and what I'm working towards. And I want to just kind of share you the visual maps and how I'm communicating with you both orally and visually. So I was listening to Dr. Adelaide Sanford's um, in an Afrocentric education as a human rights speech. And she talked about Albert Schenker. Now, Albert Schenker was the president of the Federation of Teachers from 1964 to 1997. In his capacity, he pretty much controlled our public school system nationwide. And in a lot of conversations, in a lot of historic books, he's regarded as somebody really amazing and profound who's done great things for public schools and for teachers unions and such. And he had this idea of creating equity across the board. But his ideals of how to achieve that equity was about stripping away cultural identities through education. So some of the quotes that came from this lecture that resounded with me that I want to echo on this, on this talk is never let the African-American child learn of his or her history, 
Because if they do, they will relate more to their ethnicity and they will not become an American. Now, again, the intent was to try to make us feel American, but I think it also plagued our education process and the way we keep history in a way that always filters our contributions. And so what have I specifically done? Well, I started to say it loud. So my first exhibition was in January of 2017, Say It Loud New York, where I was able to elevate the contributions of uh, diverse architects and designers, um, 22 of them. And the concept of the exhibition is to see our faces, hear our voices, feel our impact through the colorful tapestry of our heritage. So to see our faces, the labels of the project didn't just have our names, but it had our headshots really big. So you can see what we look like from across the room. I also wanted to make sure you heard our voices. So I created video, uh, video components where they have testimonials about their experience as architects and what it's been for them in the profession. And then feel our impact is through our work, because that's ultimately what you, we want you to see us through in that lens of, as architects. Um, and I want it to be bright, vibrant, loud, if you will. And so this became the genesis of just trying to elevate the contributions of those in New York. And it got invited by the United Nations to be displayed at their uh, visitor center in the New York campus. Now they had much more strict colorful guidelines and my size and my loudness was asked to be kind of contained a bit. But this still gave me an opportunity to educate and empower world leaders about representation and why it was important. They also gave me the power of the podium. So I was able to get up there and speak to them and say, listen, this is really important. Representation matters. Here's why. Here's my story. And I really need you all to make this a national movement. And before I got to my seat, they said, we're going to help you make this an international movement. In the meanwhile, we had the AIA conference in June of 2018 in New York. Oddly enough, one block away from my office at S9. And I had submitted a few panels and seminar ideas um, and exhibitions. And they were all denied. And basically because they were too specific to the African-American experience. And they wanted more broad topics so that it would be more inclusive to more of the guests. I heard that no. And I squeezed a yes out of it. First, I talked to the leaders at my office and said, hey, can I commandeer our conference rooms for a day and a half during conference? And I called the UN and said, hey, are you guys done with those boards and that model? Can I have it now? Um, and was able to create a Say It Loud AA team and have two seminar panel discussions at my office. And I got AIA to put the exhibition on the app and was able to drive hundreds of people to my office for these lectures and for the exhibition, which made me super proud. So I wanted to share that to say, even if you get a no, you can always squeeze a yes out of the no, it's just a matter of just kind of problem solving and using the same skill sets we have as architects, but kind of dealing in terms of advocating. So exactly one year from our Say It Loud UN, we launched our Say It Loud United Nations Worldwide. March 25th, 2019 was Say It Loud Day, where all across the world in United Nations information centers put up the exhibition after we translated the exhibition into eight different languages. So in the center of your screen is you're seeing how to say Say It Loud in those eight languages. And you're seeing pictures of students all over the world and the professors coming in and learning about the great work. Now this shook my soul. I could not believe that my little exhibition that I started in January 2017 had such a strong and far wide reaching global reach. But it also dawned on me in this moment, I cannot keep elevating the same 24, 22 people. I really needed to make this much bigger than just say it loud New York um, in different con contexts, but really created the movement that I had been requesting. And so I started doing a say it loud that was contextual specific and for conferences letting anybody submit. So one of the first exhibition or conferences that I submitted for was the Say It Loud South by Southwest, an audience where people would respect and understand and elevate great design but are not actually architects, right? And I wanted to make sure that as they looked at our exhibition, they didn't just kind of glance at it and keep it moving because there's a lot to see, but that when they were in our exhibition, they were captured. So I created a Say It Loud People's Choice process where you had to go through the exhibition and you get to tap on my iPad, your favorite. This did two things. 
One, it allowed me to kind of codify the metrics of success of the exhibition because I could tell how many people visited my exhibition. But then also it gave a different way of elevating the contributions because I counted a thousand people coming to a South by Southwest exhibition, but I ended up with 6,000 votes online. So I realized, whoa, Pascal, by creating a dual platform here, I'm able to uh, empower all my exhibitors to also share with their network and have them come and look at the exhibition. Uh, then we, then the following year, say it loud, uh, A19, guess who was invited to the party? <laughs> and was able to have a great uh, spot, a great area, um, was able to elevate a great number of designers and even the president, AIA's uh, 2019 president, Bill Bates, made sure he came by and said it loud as well. Uh, was really powerful and just kind of really great to see the transition between uh, A18 and A19. And so again, pushing forward and fighting for what you think is right uh, can create opportunities that you don't have to fight for down the road. Um, and then we had our Say It Loud Virginia in November of 2019. This again was leveraging the request for me to lecture. So I like to talk. I feel like you guys are getting that vibe already. And so I leveraged these uh, invitations to speak as a way of asking and prompting for a Say It Loud of that state. So here in the Say It Loud Virginia, we were able to elevate women and the diverse designers of Virginia during this conference where I was able to keynote in front of 750 people at the Architecture Exchange East Conference. So it was super dope and it was really exciting. Also in November, oh no, was my Say It Loud Pennsylvania. Um, and what was really dynamic and important about this exhibition is that the NOMA PGH group, they really push forward in terms of having different activities that engage the, uh, the greater audience. So instead of having our exhibition in highbrow, hard to reach places like the UN or uh, AIA galleries, they actually had it at a gallery where the community and the greater public can have it, come and visit. And then they programmed it like no other. I mean, there was panel discussions, networking events, um, keynote speakers, there was youth days. They really showed how it was possible to make and engage the greater audience as much as possible. And then also in November of 2019, we had Say Aloud Illinois. We were invited by the community builders who hosted and have a series of community centers all over Illinois. And we were able to elevate um, those local designers there. And it's in a space that are rented out for birthday parties, baptisms, baby showers, etc. The exhibition was supposed to be up for three weeks. It ended up being up for four months because the community said, please keep it up. And they actually had people begging not to take it down, which was amazing. We, they even used it as a backdrop in a space to do the 2020 MLK Day of Service, where the entire community came in and talked about how they can engage and help one another. And the other great highlight is the community builders own so many community centers that this is going to be our first traveling exhibition. So as the boards come down, they'll be put up in various uh, community centers throughout the Illinois communities. Um, and then we had our first School of Architecture in January of this year with uh, Say It Loud Georgia at Georgia Tech. Um, and what was interesting is that this was a difficult uh, approval to get um, in terms of getting a school of architecture to allow me to do an exhibition that really focuses on women and diverse designers. So I was really proud to have Georgia Tech be my first. And one of my favorite parts of this opportunity was being able to elevate William Stanley III and his wife, Ivanu Love Stanley, uh, who designed and built part of the campus. So really starting to elevate those legends that are in the community and knowing that part of their campus was designed and constructed by them. So I thought that was pretty dope. Um, also this year, we had the Say It Loud UK, our first international exhibition. There I was invited by the Royal Institute of British Architects, RIBA, um, and other affiliated programs, Black Female Architects and such. And what was powerful to see is although we are fighting this issue here, it is truly a global issue. And although there are nuances and bespoke issues that are different, um, really it's a unified voice that we really need to come together as a collective to see how we can start to address and make those changes. And then in March, we had our Say It Loud Ohio. This one was about six months in planning. They got the Karamu House Theater, which is the oldest African-American theater in the country. I totally thought that was the Apollo, but Apollo was whites only to like 1930s or something. Who knew? Um, we got the largest number of 
submissions ever and the large number of videos of people speaking to the experiences. And two hours before the opening of our exhibition, the governor got on the screen and said, hey y'all, COVID is crazy. Um, so no gatherings larger than 100 people. So we were only allowed to let the first 90 in. And then right after that, the doors closed and nobody actually ever got to see the Say It Loud Ohio, which broke my soul in so many ways. And I had to find another way of making sure I elevated all this amazing uh, people that we had found. Um, and so today, uh, we are launching our Say It Loud um, Nevada, and really in collaboration with the University of Las Vegas and with AIA uh, Vegas, we were really happy to really pull out a call for content and submissions. And what you'll see now, and I put the link in the chat, so feel free to click that and have all of the fun. Uh, you'll see the different thumbnails of each of the people who've submitted in their projects. And when you click on them, you'll get that full page. Mel Melvin here is my model, um, where you get to see the name of his company, where he's based, what excites him, his bio, his project achievement, information about the project, his role in the project. Um, and you can see that for all of them. And all of these funnel into our great diverse designers library. And that's a nod to Google. Google said there's not enough content out here calling us great. Here's a great diverse designers library that is specifically calling us great. Um, but I think it's important that it's not just about our headshots um, and just saying, you know, top, top five black architects to know in February or top five, top 12 women architects to know in March when it's Women's Month, but really celebrating us 24 seven and really making sure that we're constantly there as a resource and inspiration for students and for professionals as we work in this great and amazing profession. Um, and so my aspiration here is really to leverage all this amazing content that I've gathered through all uh, these exhibitions and create uh, notice in different ways. So for instance, Lego architecture series, super dope, think it's cool. Can you make sure that you have projects designed by women and diverse designers as part of the catalog? And I'm creating a learn out loud children's pop-up books where we pick the top eight designers of that state. I've been working with an artist, as you can see here, uh, where Rodney Lee Naughton has been drawn into a person here. And when you turn the page, there's a 3D pop-up of his work, and it says, I can too. And that's all going to allow those students to have uh, self-affirmations that they have the ability to change the world as architects um, so that they can find that confidence to move forward in the process. So the namesake of this lecture for me is I was asked to stand. And I wanted to share a story about why that is. So I was asked to stand is based off of an experience for me when I was at the School of Architecture at Pratt Institute. About my second week of school or so, I was in an architecture history class. A professor came into a class of maybe 70, 70 students and said, you and you stand up. So me and this other student stand, stood up and he said, okay, these two will never become architects because they're black and because they're women. And I was shocked by the audacity of the comment with to, from a professor who didn't even know my name or my capacity. And to be fair, I didn't know my capacity at that point yet because I had just started. Um, realizing that in this classroom of like 70 students is only two of us that fit that criteria. And three, that my classmates just kind of heard it as fact. And maybe they hadn't thought about it before, but now they are looking at me in a different way. They're looking at me as she's not gonna make it, it's not worth, her time, worth our time to get to know. And that also made me understand the weight of all that I was representing when I'm in a room. I grew up in Cambria Heights, Queens, which is a very Caribbean, mostly Haitian community, where I was able to speak English and Creole amongst my, my people. So it was like very black oriented education in terms of elementary. Then I went to the Mary Lewis Academy uh, Catholic all girls preparatory high school where again, I was in a community of all women, told that I'm amazing because I'm a woman and I'm brilliant because I'm a woman and expressed that through example in my education. So then to kind of enter a diverse education system and be told that I wasn't good enough for those two same kind of components <clears throat> was very shocking to me. So I shared this story and sometimes you all will think, oh, that's crazy, there's no way, or wow, what, what, a, what a unique thing that happened to her. But before COVID, when I gave this lecture, 
I would ask the audience to stand if they've ever told they couldn't because of their gender and race. And people stand. People are standing. So that's telling us a few things. One, it didn't just happen to me, it's happening. And people are standing in professional settings and people are standing at schools of architecture. People are standing at conferences. So it's happening, it's continuing to happen and we need to understand that's part of the, that's part of the oppression that's part of our, our profession is that people of color and women are being told they're not good enough, flagrantly. <clears throat> so why would my professor be so obvious to say this, right? Well, let's think about the demographics of the student applications. 5% of those who apply over the past decade have been black uh, students and 5% get enrolled, but only 3% graduate. So as we have fun and engage these small kids, I think they're adorable, and try to get them in the pipeline of applying and getting into schools of architecture, there's 2% that's missing. Now, they might say, you guys are way too fascinated with basswood. I'm good. This is not for me. Or I like team sleep. You guys are crazy. I got to go. Then it's okay. Buy 2%. But if that 2% are leaving because of those messages, are being told that their project or their thesis rooted in hip hop is an irrelevant topic, or being told create a whole new development in a black community, but erase the culture of that community are all ways and messages of how we don't belong. That's something that we need to understand and address. And what are the demographics of those professors? So 34% are licensed and 2.5% are black and 32% are women. So for me, having the ability to see teachers that look like me is not just a matter of uh, confirmation of who I am and my identity, but there's a sensitivity and a cultural awareness that's also part of that conversation. Same thing with being a woman. So um, how do we keep track of these things? How do we know our percentage and that our percentage has been stuck for the past decade? Well, there's a directory of African-American architects that was started by Bradford Grant and Dennis Mann. And they created this directory as a way of keeping track of current licensed practicing architects and practitioners nationwide. And they were keeping track of this well before NCARB and AIA and NOMA started putting out surveys for that information as well. But in January of this year, the University of Cincinnati defunded this website. They're like, ah, you know what? I don't think it's of value anymore. We're going to shut it down. Now, this is a big problem because this website was our way, our pipeline of keeping responsibility and keeping a metrics of success of how well our mentoring programs are going, how well our diversity and inclusion issues are doing, right? But without this, how can we keep track? So right now, if you type in the blackarchitects.uc.edu, you'll get a site can't be reached message. Me being super proud of Noma, we actually took over this directory. And now if you attend or type in blackarchitects.us, you now get a beautiful directory of African-American architects. You get our total numbers and how many are men and how many are women. You can actually now click per state and be able to see um, the different architects there. And I think this is really important and powerful that we keep track, that we keep accountability here in terms of making sure that we increase those numbers. So shout out to Noma, very proud of you for taking, taking on this role. And I think it's really important that we maintain places where we can keep record. <clears throat> and also understanding that there's 2.5 of us that are professors at, in terms of color. One of the things that I did historian uh, for Noma is I created a Vimeo page where I found online lectures, video testimonials, um, panel discussions that are uh, given by diverse designers and I put it here. So even if you're in school of architecture and you have no teachers that look like you or um, don't have anybody in your lecture series for the year that are African-American because they can't find us, you can go on this Noma National Vimeo page and watch hundreds of videos, uh, beautiful content that speaks to the value, the lessons, the way they design, the way they consider city planning, all that fun stuff. Uh, a year ago, we were at 1,000 views. Uh, I just checked the other day, we're at 15,000 views, so it's definitely getting out there. The Smithsonian in DC, the museum, uh, the National Museum of African American Heritage and Culture, actually listed this Vimeo page as an important resource and hyperlinks directly here. So this is pretty dope. And then on the right-hand side of your screen is your, all the kind of lectures and uh, you, university and college integrations that I've done where I try to be as present as possible. So even if you don't like public speaking, no shame, 
You can also be present in terms of crits, uh, be a jury, be there, be just visit. There's uh, many, many ways that we can engage School of Academia, even if being a professor isn't one of them. Also, full circle, I came back to Pratt and was able to help uh, organize with the NICOBA chapter a young designers conference. And it was a critical conference because we invited 58 students and 25 speakers to come in and hear about architecture and such. But we also made a design competition where it was inviting to both college and high school students. And the importance of this is that we wanted to pair college students and high school students so that students knew, even though they're in college, they were already in a position to mentor. You do not need to wait till you're 99 years old and completely had a full and robust profession for you to be able to mentor the next generation. For every step you put forward, you can pull somebody with you forward. So I just want to really echo the statement that as college kids, you have the power to already start mentoring. <clears throat> I also had crafting the interview. Got you in college, got you graduated college. Now we gotta get you jobs, right? And so we had panel discussions with HR um, head people as, a, as well as job recruiters in architecture industry to say, what are they looking for in emails? What are they looking for in the portfolio? What are they looking for in the resumes, in the CVs? And how they want you to contain or control yourself or present yourself in the answers and in your posture and such. So we had those panel discussions, we had mock interviews, and this is really another way of kind of decoding and demystifying what it takes to make it in our profession. <clears throat> also leveraging social media for social change and realizing that I really wanted to reach to the next generation of, of designers. I launched the Beyond the Built IG page and every week a different diverse designer from all over the world can take it over. And it's following the same concept of our exhibition and they talk about their journey, their education, their upbringing, the work that they're doing. We currently have 4,455 uh, excuse me, followers we featured 90 designers. So literally you can go up and you can check everyone who's ever posted ever on the page. And this is a good moment to pull out your cell phones and follow at Beyond the Built on IG. Um, and then that all those exhibitions that we've had so far, those 15 exhibitions, well, they're now part of that great diverse designers library that is sequenced in two ways. One, an alphabetical order and two, by location. Again, this is meant to be a place where you can see our faces, see our work, and learn more about us. And it's also meant to be a great business development tool for them as well, um, where you are able to say, I'm in the Nevada community and I want to hire a woman or a diverse designer. Here's another resource that you can use and have at your, uh, at your fingertips. Currently, as of today, we have 415 profiles, super excited about this, and it keeps growing. Every time we have a new exhibition, a new Say It Loud, we're able to add more and more content. And seeing what happened to Ohio with the COVID quarantining um, strategies, what I did for the beginning part of this quarantine life was actually convert all of my past exhibitions to not just photos, which was what was on the left-hand side, but now you get the photos and you get the virtual exhibition, similar to what I showed you for Say It Loud Nevada, where you're able to see all the designers and the faces of all their work that they've done, click it and take it to their profile pages. So please have fun. I want you to get familiar with the Nevada exhibition and then peruse through all of the different exhibitions and really learn about these amazing designers from all over. And so the ultimate goal is to publish a great diverse designers textbook, not just US centric, but also across the world. So on the left hand side here of your screen, you're seeing all the different countries and states that are represented in our library currently. So if you see a great space and you know a great amazing designer in those locations, please encourage them to come to the website and to submit and allow us to elevate and celebrate them. So our ancestors are our heroes and we are their legacy. So what is our challenges to becoming licensed? Well, there are plenty. I'm just gonna talk about a few. One of them is the time. So according to NAAB, it can take you about 11 to 12 and a half years to become a licensed architect after the graduation of high school. For me, which is the bottom row there, it took me 13 years. So I did do my five-year bachelor's degree. I ended up doing a one-year master's degree at Columbia. Knocked out my IDP in three years, but whoo, those ARE exams, we did not get along. It took me 14 tests before I passed the seven that was required. Um, some tests I passed the first time, 
Sometimes it was the second. Sometimes it was the fourth try. All that is to say, it took me 13 years. So we're asking for a really long time commitment from graduating high school to when you can say you are an architect. The next challenge is the cost, right? How does this become attainable and reachable to those who are socioeconomically challenged? So again, according to NAAB, it could take between $40,000 to $232,000 to become an architect. And all the way at the bottom there, that's me. Um, I Actually, it's going to cost me $67,000 to become an architect. I thought that was terrible. I mean, me and Sally Mae, we're going to be best friends. Um, my son, who is four years old, will be in college, and I will still be paying her back for my education. But now I'm seeing students who are graduating with six-figure debt, and that's without a master's degree. So again, the cost of education is super high, and another deterrent for really people who are challenged financially to come into the profession and start the journey. And what happens when you graduate after racking up all that debt? That's right, you graduate and make around $50,000, depending on how great the economy is doing. Um, and although once you're in the profession for a good period of time, that number does increase, but it's different than, let's say, doctors and lawyers who invest similar amounts in their education and come out already making six figures. <clears throat> the next component and question that I get all the time is, how can we introduce architecture to little kids of color? And my uh, response is, oh no, they don't need an introduction. They need a better relationship. Kids of color are fully aware about architecture. It's just a negative dynamic. Once you deal with the debris, the noises, the rodents, the smells, the detours, and all that goes with construction, typically the project that is unearthed that emerges isn't for that community. Typically it's a force of erasure that erases their culture and a signifier that they and their family is no longer welcome and financially able to sustain and stay in the community that they call home. So architecture is the villain to a lot of kids of color. And so we need to change that dynamic for them to even want to be part of this profession in the first place, then spend 13 years getting there and then being in debt for like all of your lives. Um, <clears throat> and then so right now there are 115,000 architects in the United States. We are still 2% African-American, and as of yesterday, 493 are women, Black women, excuse me. And I'm the 315th living African-American uh, woman architect in the United States, and I carry that proudly, and I say that, and it's prevalent in my bio because I want to say that we are here. We might be rare, but we are here. Um, I'm also highly visible to the community. I participate in, um, in parades. I protest organizations that I'm a part of to say, hey, you can do better, you will do better, so help me. <laughs> I share my story far and wide, just like our, we are doing right now, and really trying to be just a larger picture than just uh, in our niche, but actually to a greater community. Um, I share our experiences, so making room for our stories and our narratives to be told. So see what he, some of the uh, titles of that panel discussion I was telling you about from AIA 18, um, and then also creating a lecture series uh, designed behind J. Max Bond Jr., who was a very prolific and important architect in New York, and making sure that we have an annual Archtober event that amplifies his voice and his work. I protect our, our history. So when articles that are put out and they're wrong, I have no hesitation in marking them up. Um, I find the time to highlight and put it on blast online. But just beyond just being mad for the sake of being mad, I use this opportunity as an important mechanism to create MOUs and relationships with these publications to ensure that we can create a good content moving forward. So right now, annually, I give multiple articles to NCARB and not me as in Pascal, but the historian seat of NOMA gives two or three articles per year to NCARB for that purpose. And Again, getting articles to be taken down that are inaccurate where they're calling AIA the African American Institute of Architects and really naming two different Black women architects by different names. It's a mess. But anyway, I make sure that I speak to them and make sure that they make those corrections and leverage that to make a better, more sustainable relationship. <clears throat> so my long-term goal is to have really strong relationships with publications. And I started doing that on Juneteenth. I launched a Say It With Me or Say It With Media a Dismantling Injustice Initiative, which is under that tab, where it's an MOU 
where I have the different publications committing to a few things. Um, and right on the website, there's a portal where they can fill out their name, upload the information, and make the commitment so that it's kind of captured in record. Now, what are those commitments? One is to do an audit of their publication and figure out how much of their art, uh, publication is showing women and diverse designers and inc commit to increasing that percentage by 5% annually until a minimum of 15% is reached. To create content that specifically calls us great. And if you don't use the word great, fine. Whatever comparable language that you speak about white male architects, use the same when you're speaking about women architects and architects of color that we are also great, else you wouldn't be writing about us. See what I did there? Um, also including research and development of historical content based on uh, diverse designers' contributions to the built environment. What I'm doing with my Say Aloud is ca capturing contemporary designers, but we really wanna, want them to leverage their research, researching and development team to find historical content as well. And then also pledging to create content that helps educate about how architecture is used as a tool to facilitate oppression. Um, and when we talk about Jedi work, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, we often talk about it in the framework of a profession and a practice in a firm. But in actuality, architecture can be advocates as well. So a great example is the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which I affectionately call the Lynchin Museum. Um, this museum was very controversial. People did not understand why we would want to do a piece of architecture that would talk to us such a dark past. Now, here's the problem. Two things. Number one, it is not a past. It is very much present. So if you are disturbed by pieces of metal hanging from the ceiling that are inscribed with the names and dates and locations of those who have been lynched, then you should bring that same energy when people are, of color are being lynched every day. And that lynching can be the example of George Floyd, or it could be this young kid in New Hampshire who was hung by a, t a t group of high school students who thought it was funny. He had a rope, a noose put around his neck and hung from a tree in front of his little sister who was able to get help in time to save his life. But to see this uh, chocolate baby with rope burns uh, around his neck and to hear law enforcement not want to press charges because these were good kids um, was very frustrating. So again, it's important that we understand that lynching and hanging of people of color is not something of the past. Second, history is something that is being um, erased in terms of a lot of ways. The word slavery is being erased from textbooks because it makes people feel uncomfortable and being replaced with words like unpaid laborer. Photos of slavery is actually pictures of black people dressed up having picnics in the field. I am not kidding. These are being shown in textbooks. Um, and so it is important that architects are used as a tool to keep history and to make sure that we are aware of our past because we might understand that slavery happened, our kids might, but our kids' kids, if this erasure force continues, might start to even question the existence and the hor horrific nature of what slavery was. It's technically. <clears throat> the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC, um, the, we actually found that it became a request back in 1915 was the earliest date when we tried to get this museum done. And we were told African Americans have not done anything of significance that would warrant a museum on the mall. So this, the museum itself is a protest. It is a 100 year fight to, to capture space. This project was designed and constructed by a great diverse team, David Ajay, Phil Freelon, and uh, J. Max Bond Jr. Um, but also it is a building that elevates our contributions to the world and is a place that keeps our artifacts safe. And so it's important to understand the layers of importance of architecture then what they serve and how they serve our community when they are um, designed and constructed. Then you have the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, which was done by Phil Freelon. Um, and what I, this project's actually in Atlanta. And one of the most uh, soul-shaking exhibitions I had ever uh, uh, experienced, specifically whenever it becomes safe for us to travel, I highly recommend you head to Atlanta please come see this stunning project and specifically sit at this lunch counter um, exhibition where you sit down on the counter, you put your hands and there's a clock in front and you put your headphones and you hear things like you don't belong here, you, you know, whatever, um, you're dirty, you're a monkey or whatever, get out. 
you hear dishes and glasses being broken all around you. And then for special points, they shake the chair, the stool shakes underneath you so you can feel as if people are hitting you. And you're supposed to try to keep your hand still on the counter for as long as possible. And that's the point of those comp out clocks. Um, I thought, hey, I'm a New Yorker. I could totally hang. Psh, couldn't, couldn't handle it for not even like five seconds. It was a lot. Um, it just a series of emotions that really helped transform me. So seeing how architecture, how this exhibition can take an experience that people went through in real life and give me a glimpse, a small glimpse of it that shook me to the point where I was in tears is really powerful to understand the, the power of ar architecture. <clears throat> so J. Max Bond Jr. again is a, a powerhouse in New York. I'm so super proud to be part of the team that got uh, West 162nd Street renamed J. Max Bond Jr. Way. Um, and so the hope is as kids like, oh, I live on, you know, J. Max Bond Jr. Street, they can kind of look him up and see his contributions to the built environment, to the profession and all that he's done. Um, and then the African Barrier National Monument was my very, very first project as an intern. Here is a project where they're excavating to build yet another federal building. They started finding and discovering uh, slave remains. They were chucking those out until somebody whistle blew. Um, Howard University took over the site and really um, uh, did the research on the bones and found that there were babies as small as eight months to adults as old as 60 years old on the site. There was over 800 remains, but it was also discovered and, and um, kind of shared that all of downtown Manhattan, and we inscribed it on the size of the chamber here. You can kind of see where my mouse is. The full map of downtown Manhattan and the estimated 20,000 African slave bones that are buried in the site. So all the federal buildings, all the city halls, all those buildings are literally and spiritually and conceptually built on the bones of African slaves. Seriously. Um, so this one lot just captures that moment, that history, but it actually helps tell the story of all of downtown Manhattan. And these grass mounds that here that I'm pointing to are actually those 800 uh, remains reinterred on site so that when you come to this monument, it's not where you take lunch, it's not where you have a date, this is not where you skate, but this is where you come and uh, understand about our history and be a place of remembrance and healing. Um, I also leverage my uh, mentorship as an ACE mentor. Shout out to the ACE mentoring program um, and working with the students. And together, we actually designed a new campus in Haiti uh, that had collapsed uh, during the 2010 earthquake where I lost a lot of family. So I got a commission to do a project at school there and I was able to kind of merge my two passions and my two identities into one uh, advocacy moment. Also about buildings being environmental, fighting for environmental justice. So this is one of our projects in Boston, uh, 888 Boylston, which is the highest performing uh, speculative building in all of New England. And we really tried to push and fight for as many sustainable um, strategies for the project as possible. So making architecture also fight for environmental justice is another way of protest and how architecture can be the remembrance of our values. Bronx Point is the project that I'm working on right now, uh, where it has 542 affordable housing um, tenants, plus the first brick and mortar hip hop museum, community spaces, uh, public park, upland connections, plazas. This is a project that's dedicated to the community for the community um, and try to embed the culture, the hip hop into the architecture, into the design as well. And so when you look at it, does it look like projects? No, it looks like a place of dignity where people will be happy and proud to call home. <clears throat> and I also, what I'm aspiring to do more and more is to replace oppressive monuments with those of our great leaders in community spaces. And really that has taken off over the past few weeks or months um, and having us reconsider what are those monuments, those uh, fig figures that are placed at the highest peaks of those communities as a way of statement of saying, you know, these slave owners, those who fought against your freedom is located at the highest peak of your community is a statement about how limited your freedom really is. So really thinking about the true extent of what those uh, spaces and those components mean and re-envisioning and reimagining for what they can be for other people and how they can heal the community. And last section, architects as activists. So it's not just about, about the work we do, but how we do the work, right? So we have Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation. If you do not know who she is, you missing out. Um, she was a really amazing, she is a really amazing architect. And when she was retiring, she actually had her developer clients 
sign a commitment saying that they wouldn't hire any architecture firms that didn't have women um, in their partner or principal levels. And guess what? A whole bunch of firms who was used to getting, you know, recurring work from these organizations found, started finding women and started elevating them to partner and principal level. And not just to have them propped on a seat, but actually having to mentor them and prepare them because once you're at that position, you have equity and power in the way that the, the firm and the companies run. So really by her understanding, sometimes when you're fighting for change in the profession and we don't want to make the move, you can just go to the client and make the move really come in uh, for another approach. So I think she's amazing, built by women, look out for her work and her stuff. Her organization's amazing. You have the National Organization of Minority Architects, NOMA. We have uh, chapters all over the United States. Um, Please, if you're, there's a NOMA chapter near you, I highly recommend that you connect and volunteer and participate and see. Next year is our 50th anniversary of us constantly, and that's our main mission. It's about fighting for equity and, and justice in the profession. So this is a great organization to support as well. Um, NOMA has a project pipeline. I kind of talked about this in the beginning about inspiring those little kids about architecture where we have multi-day camps where we really, again, walk kids around their community, get them excited about architecture. They design a project and present it to one another and their parents at the end of the day. It's really amazing. And we've been having lots of virtual project pipeline camps. So I know with COVID, but I still think there's a way for you to give back, um, even from the comfort of your home. Um, so it's something to look out for. So if you can, please volunteer to these project pipeline camps. Um, there's also architects and designers such as Tiffany Brown, who's out in Detroit, her organization is called 400 Forward. So instead of trying to reach a thousand students one weekend, she's committed to taking on, I believe, eight girls every year, where she takes them to lectures, construction sites, architecture firms. She speaks to them about the profession. She gets speakers to come speak with them, writes their recommendation letters, and really stewards them through the process of becoming an architect. And her idea is really having really great and a consistent presence in their future. So for you, if you're feeling shy and you don't feel like this kind of overarching one time kind of touch point is your process, this is another great advocacy model that I highly encourage. And I think it's incredible work. So if you don't know about Tiffany Brown, now you know. Um, there's Brian Lee out of New, Louisiana, New Orleans. Um, he does design justice or DAP, design as protest. Uh, he has a huge virtual component of uh, people that are creating a series of programs and entities and such. They have bi-weekly, no, I'm sorry, two times a week, Mondays and Wednesdays calls that talks about different initiatives that they're doing. So again, if you think this could be something that's of interest, highly recommend that you look into Brian Lee Jr. and the Design as Protest movement. <clears throat> also, you have Mike Ford, the Hip Hop Architecture Camp. Uh, he's probably the most successful out of all of us who's kind of broken out of the profession, where he uses uh, hip hop as a way of connecting kids to architecture. He talks about how hip hop music usually talks about and critiques architecture. And so what he does through this program with these kids is get them excited about architecture, um, shows them how to design and the importance of concepts by decoding uh, lyrics. But then also, he has the kids create a rap song that speaks about how they're going to use architecture to, to change and solve the issues of their community. So you can definitely go on his website and listen to all these great rap songs of all these kids from different places. I had the amazing pleasure of being at the, the Bronx one for the Hip Hop New York camp. Really phenomenal stuff. It's really inspiring. Um, and he also has virtual um, camps. Look into that. And then we are collaborating with NumTech and we're creating the See It Loud Augmented Reality app in camp. Again, leveraging the content that we have from all these Say It Loud exhibitions, creating a Pokemon Go, if you will, situation where you have a map that indicates uh, products that are designed by women and diverse designers. And you can actually create art inspired by what you see, capture it on your mobile device and see it 3D projected at one-to-one -one scale on the building through your mobile device. Um, so really leveraging the content that we're gathering from all these exhibitions and finding ways of uh, empowering others to kind of know about this important work. Um, <clears throat> come on computer, you're almost there. So I believe this slide, if it does come up, talk to the different organizations or the different initiatives that I have in my organization, um, which has the uh, Say It Loud exhibitions, the, um, which is focused on professionals and students. We have the Learn Out Loud children's pop-up book, which is focused on small kids. And then we have the See It Loud Augmented Reality app in camp that really focuses on preteens and teens, most likely to have a mobile device and all that fun stuff. 
Um, so the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in the moment of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at the times of challenge and controversy. In that moment I was asked to stand, I feel like with what's happening in the world, we are being called to stand. I'm standing and I really hope you stand with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Fantastic. Pascal. Wow, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> I think most of us are. I kind of feel like um, I've just been told, hey, you know your house is on fire and, and there are some things you need to be doing. <laughs> and certainly there are. I was making notes as you were speaking and, um, you know, I'm, I'm just so excited to hear about all that you have done and uh, the changes that you have already made. So uh, thank you for sharing all of that with us. My You're an inspiration you. for us to, to move forward here. And you know, our, our um, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, task force, Mel Green is our chair, and uh, Monica, of course, is a, a member. Sydney Katz is the co-chair. Um, Jeremy Campbell is uh, with us as well as a member. And we are right looking at what do we do now? What can we do? How can we affect change in our own community? And um, so that's what this is all about. And I, I'm just so excited to, to have uh, had this and recorded your session because I'll have to go back and listen several times in order to gather all of the, the things that you have done and all of the suggestions you have made. I don't want to waste any more time. I know we've got questions and Mel, I'm going to ask you to uh, please um, be our moderator and, and begin the discussion here. Oh, excellent. Um... Pasquale, I am, I am so emotional right now because one of the things that you mentioned about standing up and saying that you're never going to be architect. I grew up in a country, work, worked in the fields all my life. Same thing happened. I was a token black. I was the only one there out of hundreds of students, but I made it because I always felt that if you pass that exam, that makes you as equal to anyone else who took that exam. So I'm really excited about that. And like Randy was saying, there's a lot of things that we can use for our committee. And we're going to be picking your brains quite a bit there. Sounds good. <laughs> so I would just, <laughs> so what I would like to do is just to welcome everybody here uh, to our panel discussion. And uh, we're, so, we're so glad to, that you're here. My name is Mel Green. I'm the principal of KME Architects, and uh, I will be your moderator for tonight's panel discussion. And uh, we encourage all our online guests to submit any questions that they may have via the um, Zoom chat. And to get started, uh, in light of the current events that uh, we're having right now, we're excited to bring uh, our panel discussion of four outstanding individuals. Pasquale, you've introduced yourself such a wonderful way of your presentation. So tell me, is there something special other than what you've done about yourself that we should know? Because you've talked about yourself, so I can't really introduce you. Um, no, I think maybe the most underrated thing that I don't talk enough about is me being a mom. Um, and I think that's important oh, that we all kind of hold that uh, experience there because that taught me about a whole other layer of how the built environment Absolutely. is not designed and the profession is really um, in a place that, you know, is, is failing us in a lot of capacities. But I think okay. I've talked too much about me. I want to hear more about you all now. Absolutely. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our rest of our panel, Monica, Jeremy, and Sydney. Monica, can you give us a little bit of information about your background? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Monica Gresser, um, owner, principal, citizen architect for Brazen Architecture. Um, so got into um, advocacy 
for um, neighborhoods um, several years ago, started things like Brazen uh, Conversations in 2015, where we talked about um, uncomfortable topics. Thank you for Pascal for bringing up uncomfortable. Uh, talked about uncomfortable topics that really led us to homelessness and uh, homelessness in, uh, with youth and homeless and um, you know, underprivileged uh, where, wherever it happens and poverty in seniors. Uh, from there, we went into um, homeless advocacy and housing advocacy. Um, and now you see more of this happening where, um, you know, we look at lower income neighborhoods and people who are living paycheck to paycheck are not even that and they're behind on rent and they've been behind on rent for rent for years. Um, so they're our next, uh, they are borderline homeless all the time. Um, so, you know, it, it's just becoming more and more difficult. So even though primarily brazen is um, commercial architecture and that's really what my background is, this has really become quite a big um, issue do for me. And so I'm trying to tie it all together um, with um, my staff and we're working with um, a neighborhood most people call Naked City because that is the um, more local name for it, but it's uh, it's next to um, the stratosphere here in Lucas. Uh, so that's really working on now. Jeremy, can you give us a little uh, information about yourself? Right. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Hello. Okay. My name is Jeremy Jason Campbell. I am actually kind of unique in a way that I am born and raised from Las, in Las Vegas. Um, I had the opportunity to graduate with a Bachelor of Architecture from Howard University, class of 2011. And I actually lucked out and my first job was at a minority owned firm owned by Mel Green. And now I'm working at um, KGA and as a project coordinator. Thanks, Jeremy. Sydney. Hi, everyone. Am I being heard? Yes. Okay. Yes, you are. You. Um, my name is Sydney Katz. I've been in this journey uh, since being in high school here in Las Vegas. I'm born and raised in Las Vegas, come from, um, you know, m my mother is black and my father raised me to be Jewish. And I have adopted a lot of those principles um, throughout my life. I've had a lot of privilege to attend school and to uh, be a part of this journey basically since the start of high school. I feel like um, I have a lot of uh, just privilege and I'm honored to be here because I think that I can situate myself in such a way that I have an inside look of what it means to seek mentors and then what it means to be a mentor myself and I am so emotional <laughs> so this is so hard but I'm so here, happy to be here and I'm also the co-chair for AIA EDI, which is just amazing to, um, like Randy, I was taking notes as Pascal was just, that was so awesome, seriously. Um, content creators, especially right now, we need to see this. And now that we have, there's like no excuse, right? So. There's going to be a lot of fun stuff that we're going to be able to do through, uh, you know, our actions backed up by so just literally so many examples. So that's enough about me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, as you know, uh, we're living in a difficult time right now um, with the coronavirus, Black Lives Matter oh. movement, George Floyd. And a divided nation. So um, I think we in the architectural profession, we need to speak the truth. I mean the truth. We need to be honest on how we feel and act. And we all know there's a lot of systemic racism in the world. So that brings me to my first question. Um, how can architects and designers fight for justice within the built environment? Would anyone want to Tackle that? 
I'll start with that one. Um, okay. with, with a few things. I think the number one overarching uh, message that I want to echo today is really about engaging the greater community in the process and in the profession. And there are architecture firms like Concordia out in Louisiana who have something called a community fellow. For, so for each of their projects, they actually have a paid position for a community leader to participate in their weekly, bi-weekly design meetings. Now this is different than mandated community board meetings where you show up twice, cold pizza, flatless soda at the weird hours of the day in these weird locations and then show it to the community and say, just check this box and said you saw this, right? This is literally saying community, we need you to be part of our design process. Your opinions and your thoughts have value, hence we are paying you for it. And we want you to be both a conduit of bringing us information in but also sharing information with your communities to explain why we can and can't do things. So I think that's another way of kind of understanding that we have a power as a profession to pull the community into the conversation and not necessarily just rely on the client to do so. Because as you can understand, the profession, who our clients are and who the end user is, is not necessarily one and the same. So I think that's really powerful. But it's also recognizing how the built environment has been used as a tool of oppression. So we talked about, you know, monuments, for, for example. Well, another great example, which I literally just found out was about William Moses, which I thought like, you know, or yeah, Moses, he did all of like our, our central park and a lot of our landscaping and he was a great urban planner and didn't know he really didn't like black people. So when he was designing <laughs> Jones Beach, he made sure that the highways overpasses were nine feet or lower because he knew that the way that black communities was transporting was through buses. And so by creating bridges that were lower than that, that time, that threshold, he was essentially using architecture as a way of stopping black people from reaching those spaces. So we need to understand those stories, those, those lessons, um, and understand that the built environment is impregnated with racism and oppression. And we need to recognize that, that it's being as a tool is that way. And then really being a, a force of rectifying that and creating spaces that are really focused for the community, the greater community. Any other comments from anyone else? I have a great example here locally in Las Vegas, west side of uh, Las Vegas. Um, there, are, there are always natural barriers and also man-made barriers that segregate a section of town. I've been here since 1983 and west Las Vegas has not developed at all. We are in the process of doing a 100-year plan now, so hopefully that will take seed. There was an incident where F Street was actually blocked off because they were afraid that people leaving from the Smith Center would take a wrong turn and go into the West Side community. So I do understand that it is so important to recognize how architecture creates those racial barriers. Fortunately for us, the community fought and they were able to reopen F Street. I'd like to add something to that as well, um, especially when um, both Pascal and Melvin, you know, um, the injustices of, of architecture. So um, simply put, the, the lack of uh, recognition for very influential and just powerful community members, um, Paul Williams, literally the the first african-american aia member yes designed majority of that west side why are we not celebrating that something that i've been able to um take in um throughout just being a young person and with my privilege, being able to see and reflect and empathize with what is going on in my own city. Um, mm -hmm. there, I tie this in with a concept of psychogeography, which is a concept that I never even knew about until maybe two years ago, where you're situating yourself in a city walking. What do you see? What do you feel? How do you feel? Do you feel connected? Um, when we talk about architecture, being able to bring people together, um, I believe we could also even branch into the um, civil engineering aspects of it. Why is our city so inaccessible by foot? Why are our transportation systems not as developed as other cities? You know what I mean? What, what are the drivers that uh, 
allow these uh, creations to sort of take flourish. And also with Melvin and Monica contributing to projects that are um, predominantly pro bono, you've worked for free to create really meaningful pieces of work that benefit the community. So I am on the path to licensure and the action behind that I, I that we are going to have to tackle is we can be inspired as much as we want, but the barriers that are in place to that hinder the process, like you, Pascal, you mentioned that you 14 tries to take those ARE exams. I've heard of horror stories of I'm not I don't want to take this test like we have to study we have to do study groups but you know what those tests cost so much money to retake and in the past and I've, I'm so thankful I'm so thankful for all the years that I've been able to listen to for years where when uh, like back in the day interns were not paid they were unpaid laborers as you mentioned in your lecture, the word slavery being erased with that word. I'm over here being like the practicing architect that I hope to be. And I listen to that and I'm like, unpaid laborers, that's like how it was for you guys back in the day being interns working for free. Now interns are gonna be paid for their work because their hands are on very important work. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought, <laughs> but um, that's, that's, I kind of get a little heated. Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. see it. You were actually you were actually right on part because my next question was, you know, how does architecture serve the people and the greater community? And you pretty much answered that quite a, quite a bit. You know, one of the things, and I'm sure Monica can probably um, attest to this, is that I have, and and I told you guys before that my name is in the West Side is called Robin from the Hood because I spend a lot of time spending um, time with people who have their dreams and they don't have the means to make those dreams come to fruition. So I spend a lot of pro bono time doing uh, African-American museums, doing 10 story veteran buildings, doing a grocery store. But it's part of where, where I come from is the nature of, of the empathy that we all need to have as architects to be able to look at the vision culturally and be able to produce something that is going to um, to help help that along the along the way. So I do understand that there's a lot of pro bono work that's being done in the West Side. Monica, Monica, maybe you can talk a little bit about it. Yeah, well, we are not in the West Side. We are um, closer to the um, stratosphere. But so who we're dealing with is um, lower income folks, right? Um, so people who, 49% of the people in this neighborhood have a car, um, but not necessarily a great means, um, not, a ac not great access to transportation. Grocery stores um, are as close as two miles away. So that's where we're working um, and trying to figure out, like, how do we help that neighborhood become better? So we've been working on that for about five or six years now, trying to find our way in there. And um, the city of Las Vegas has helped us um, with that. Um, and so a Stupac Community Center, um, but really Casa de Luz, which, who's a local charity right there in the neighborhood has been really helpful in terms of how do we make these connections for people? Because I think people don't really understand that um, what we are trying to do is figure out what they need instead of here, let me, let me tell you what you need. Um, I don't want you to tell me what I need because you don't know what I need unless you come in here and ask me what I need. Um, and so I think that that's really important that uh, we tell people that we're not there to make their lives better unless they can tell us how that happens. So we had a, we had a number of failures um, uh, trying to reach mm -hmm. adults, but kids, oh my goodness, kids are so open. Um, and in the time of COVID, we all masked up and um, we held eight workshops during the summer with kids. Um, and we went as, you know, as tiny as we walked through neighborhoods and said, what do you hear, see, and smell? 
and they told us what was in their neighborhood. And then we brought that all back into the workshops and said, how do you interpret that? And where do we come up with other ideas? It's just interesting how um, you think that, you think that um, you know who the kids are and what they're doing, and that's not true. They, they're just, they just have a totally different um, outlook on what it is that um, you see. So I'm finding that really fascinating and how we had to approach this idea from a different point of view. Um, and so we'll do it again in the fall, but it'll look a little bit different than what, it's, what we're doing now. So that would be uh, my take on um, advocacy um, for neighborhoods and our attempt is going to be not to gentrify. Um, so that's, that's what we really hope for. Um, we just got to figure out how to do that. Um, but that also leads back into affordable housing and I co-chair um, that AIA uh, committee. Um, and last year, um, our chapter president, Dwayne Eschenbaugh, started um, the, the affordable housing charrette. And I think that was a really, um, that was a really good idea. Um, helped us to look at um, what's going on in housing. And I think it opened a lot of people's eyes in terms of what it is we're facing here in the Valley. I also kind of wanted to challenge this idea that advocacy work equated to pro bono work. Mm. And Monica talked about that yeah. greatly there too, but you know, there's other ways there's, uh, again, there's other architects who are taking the position as developer. So we're mm -hmm. not in the position mm -hmm. of reading in the RFP, but we're in the position of writing the RFP. Um, there's people like Maurice Cox and R. Stephen Lewis, who became the head of the Department of Architecture and Planning um, in Detroit and created a zero displacement policy. So with all the developers had to come forward with projects for waterfront projects and development, they all had to accommodate and design for the community that was there. Um, and they all rose to the occasion. Lots of beautiful projects, you know, was able to kind of create and be developed in that pipeline, but we were in a position to create that policy. So as we strive to be on the cover of magazines, there's also being on a community board to be in the room to say, no, this com community already has five wastewater treatment facility plants. We do not need a sixth, right? Like we actually have to be in the room to protect those communities and you be in a way to protect um, the built environment in that regard. So I think there's business models of ways how we could do advocacy as well as volunteering work, but I just wanted to just kind of decouple that kind of connection and also decouple this idea of fighting for justice being something that's recent development and uncomfortability. Uncomfortability for who? I've been uncomfortable, uncomfortable since that professor asked me to stand. So why do we, why do we care about uncomfortability right now? We're fighting for justice um, and that just takes growth. And I think that's what's good um, for um, for Mel and I having contacts and having having a way to know who to contact uh, at the city, and how to mm -hmm. bring people's um, worries and concerns to the, the right place and the right time. Um, you know, so that's some of what we've been working on as well. And I'm sure Mel has too. We're working on speed uh, cushions in the neighborhood right now, and that's all because Casa de Luz asked me to um, find out how do we put in speed humps, and we're like can't do that anymore and um, you know now we do speed cushions or traffic cushions and uh, so we're you know that's something we're working on we're actually doing um, a canvassing we're not doing that Thursday we're doing something about that and then we'll do canvassing next week. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're doing and, and Pasquale touched on it is that <clears throat> we're looking to invest in the west side. I think it's important that, you know, we, we do that. And uh, we did the first elementary, two-story elementary school there. And the first thing we did, we walked the neighborhood. We wanted to make sure what the parents wanted in a school. They wanted an outdoor amphitheater. They wanted a garden. And most of the students walked to, uh, to school. So we created an outdoor plaza for the parents to actually converse in the morning when the kids were, were, were in school. That way it gave the community um, outreach for them. And so uh, it worked very well. West Side School, the same thing. We created a, um, a area so there's uh, opportunity for a farmer's market, outdoor art shows. Uh, so those types of things are, are to me ways that architecture can, uh, can be an advocate for the community. Um, one other question that I have is, uh, does architecture uh, mirror society? In terms of culture, design, uh, we had the African American Museum. So, what what do you guys think about that? I think in 
some cities it does. I don't think in mm-hmm. Vegas it does. I think we're, we're trying to go that route. Um, I know there's little bits and pockets where you have the history of you know, that street. Um, but I don't really think Las Vegas, well, Las Vegas as a whole don't have culture. We tear down our buildings. We tear down you know, casinos because they're old. So I think that's one of the challenges that we have as a my, minority that we have to really find something and design something that's going to last for 50 years or till after we die because we're in a culture in a city that just love to demolish. We have celebrations of buildings just being blown up. So I think it's in other cities, the culture is embedded in there, but in Las Vegas, I don't really think that we have really a culture. Well, in some ways, I think we're, we do need to work on that a little bit more. We are, I think there are, there are some movements that work that direction, but I mean, when you talk about the culture uh, or does it reflect us? It doesn't because we're really based in tourism. Um, and so we, and we have been pretty much since we've, you know, since Vegas started, right? So when you look at that, then no, it's not. But there are there are those pockets where you see a little bit of us, whatever the us is, um, here and there. And hey, so my office is on Industrial Road, and right in front of my office, they now call it Sammy Davis Jr. It's a little spit of street, you know. And you know what a great icon. And yet um, he's got a little piece of street. <laughs> I'd like to touch base. You know, I'm just amazed, Monica. My first uh, office was on in Naked City back in 1995, so I can tell you some stories. I bet you. <laughs> um, I'd like to touch base on that as well, Melvin, if that's okay. Sure. All right. So, um, yeah, I, so, you know, Las Vegas is like an enigma, right? Like, there is culture, but whose culture is it? You know what I mean? Like there, because it's embedded in tourism, there are so many opportunities to find very cultural ties to certain things, but the mentality of Las Vegas is still focused on the strip. Um, just like in other cities, I went to Austin, Texas, and they have a strip, and I'm like, what's this about? Like, it's just a bunch of bars, but this is like a place where uh, people can call home, but something that I do think that Las Vegas has, like, I've had to discover it um, personally through, like, when Monica mentions Casa de Luz, I had never known about that community, that church that is situated in Naked City. Naked City has a whole lot of origin to what it meant to be in Las Vegas back in the day when you have performers who work on the strip and then um, especially adult entertainment and they'll leave the strip and they'll be situated in these little areas. So you mentioned the, the demolition of like like, yeah, like, which is so true. Like, you can go on online and you can watch the demolition videos of um, casinos. And it, that resonates with so many, like, Las Vegas locals. It resonates with investors, all that stuff. But you want to know what? The Moulin Rouge, I don't know why that had to be demolished. That has such a big history with Las Vegas. Why was it demolished? we have the power as architects to address that and situate ourselves to be the, you know, the the force of change, you know what I mean? But back to Casa de Luz, back in 20, uh, yeah, 2019, or towards like the beginning of 2019, um, through our involvement with the AIAS, which is the student version of how this panel is uh, composed today, um, just as, what we were a small group of just four people. You had um, Ma'el Egia, um, William Zhang, Nick Goodman, and me uh, getting in contact with Casa de Luz so that we can help provide a new front lawn for them because they 
had been wanting a com like they are already a force to be reckoned with within their community however their architecture isn't built for that they had a big old monument that was sort of in the middle of like where you could have congregations so needless to say through the involvement of AIAS it was not just to uh, polish our resumes you know what I mean it was literally the huge opportunity to see a project come from an idea that is supposed to be meaningful and then it like we can see the the fruition of it and I my involvement with that was to provide funding for this project that project cost over two thousand dollars to do how did we do it I had to reach out to um, companies who have money to give to 501c3 uh, organizations and then all that we needed to do was like this is an open platform for students and adults to come together and show up, dig and install some pavers. Like literally just, we did it in two weekends, which is not easy, but we had to rely on uh, the support of our peers. And how difficult is it for students to be able to pay for all of their school, be successful in their courses, and get involved with the community. It seems impossible, but then these are literally the examples that Pascal was showing us. Like, you know, we can, with all this extra work, but also the support of um, shared value, you know what I mean? So I hope that ties back into what you had originally asked, but, cause I feel like I'm taking bits and pieces from what we're all speaking about. Cause this is so complicated, but yeah, it is pretty simple. There's so much that, uh, we're still like definitely the the culture i i'm still thinking about you know whose culture is actually more present um in las vegas and i'm i'm happy to say that we're starting to see a little bit more especially when we start to recognize you know who are the influential people who have really built this city back to paul williams you know what i mean so but i also Absolutely. one of the That's things that one of the things that we have that Pascal's um, presentation has shown us is that I think you start, you do that first thing and, and, um, and you be energetic about it. And that first thing will provide opportunities for you to uh, enhance on that and, and make it bigger and make it, take it another step. And, and that's, I think what, what the EDI needs to concentrate on. What is our first step? And then how do we, how do we take it a step further and a step further? Just as Pascal has done across all of the states and, and uh, all of the projects that she's been involved with. So I think, you know, that's a real inspiration. And I think we've got a good start, Mel, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I think we got to start. We need to take that uh, press exhibit and uh, take it to all the high schools, junior high schools, uh, elementary exactly. schools. Exactly. And, and start there. Um, I, I think that's something that uh, we're looking to do as well as uh, mentoring for all of the uh, intern architects because it's, it, it sets me quite a bit that I have to turn away a lot of expiring in, in, intern architects who want to wanna attend college but don't have the uh, expertise to understand about grant writing. I mean, how to get grants and loans, and it's, it's just unfortunate. So what I try to do is I try to mentor them uh, by having them come out of my office and then, hey, look, this is what needs to be done, or call Sydney and have Sydney talk to them as a student. So that's that's very important. And when we did the Wooden of Pee Wee in elementary school, I know we're getting off. We have like a couple more questions, but I think it's so important to, to kind of talk about this because it's going to be all organic anyway in terms, in terms of, of our question. But I was able to uh, form a junior architect program when we built the school. So we actually had a student from each grade level um, be a part of our team, and then they will report back to their class. So those types of things, I think that's important in order to start that pipeline that uh, Pascal was talking about. Um, but I, I think as I, I wanna challenge your team here, cause we keep talking about EDI um, and yes. I wanna put justice in there, right? I think architecture yeah. in the profession 
needs to be a relevant and positive force towards fighting for civil rights. Um, we tend to look internal to our, our firms, our firm performance, us, our numbers, but really it's not about us. It really isn't. We are a resource, we are a tool, we are a bridge that connects and we need to really make sure that that bridge is landing at the general public's feet. And we need to fight for justice and equity. And once you have that, that will equal diversity and inclusion. And what we've been trying to do thus far is push for diversity and inclusion, but not have, but not have been at the forefront of fighting for justice and not have been creating equity in the profession in the first place. So it's not sustainable. So I really want to just push you all to be Jedi masters. See what I did there? Um, and think about justice as part of the component of what you're fighting for and not just uh, ancillary to, to us as professionals, but really how are we changing the world for everyone? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, another question is, um, um, how does the lack of diversity um, challenge uh, the firms and how do they keep them flourishing their businesses? So. There's always a lack of rep representation, a diverse representation. One of the reasons why I started my firm back in 1995 is because I felt that my voice wasn't being heard at the firm that I worked with. So how, how, how do we move forward with that in terms of diversity? I think it starts with the, it starts with the people with the money, the, the clients. If, um, Purcell said it earlier yeah. with um, the the lady that retired and the Beverly client, Beverly. yeah, Beverly. When what's her what's her last name? Willis. Willis, and how she said like, do not you know partner or work with firms that do not have a certain amount of percentage of women in the head position. I think that's where it starts, where they have to really get in their head and it's moving towards it a little bit where if you look at the stadium there was a certain amount of percentage that had to be minority owned or you have to partner with minority firms but i think that's where it starts the money is where it starts so if you have the client that says you know what you have to have minority in your team then we can move to the next level where now since the firms are not that's larger, that's not minority based, they have to partner with smaller firms. Now these smaller firms, whether it's engineering, architecture, they can revisit their fees and say, hold, hold up, let me see how we can adjust this so we can get paid a little bit more because we're valuable. And so when they see that their fees, the fees of their, the, the, well, the people that they wanna you know, co-sponsor, is higher that I think will make them look at it like, okay, we need to really think about what we're doing at our firm and how we're hiring and how we're rate tra training these people, training minorities, training women to be in upper position because that's where it's kind of falling short. Firms are not, I, firms are diverse, but they're not diverse in the areas that they need to be diverse. There, there's a lot of diversity in the drafters but in the head positions, they're not. So I think that's where when clients and when smaller firms that work together, I think we can really change the notion of how diversity and how men of um, women and minorities can really reach up into the um, upper, posi upper positions on the firms. So, so Jeremy, I think I, I understand in terms of educating the, the principals uh, in, in providing a, a mentorship program that would then allow them to, uh, to elevate to higher positions. Um, for, for our firm, we are a, a small business that happens to be minority, but we were able to uh, team up on a, on a major project here and use that exact exact model where we were able to do meaning, meaningful work. We weren't just put in a corner doing stair details uh, and, and because we were just there because they needed us to, to, to meet the requirements, the minority requirements. We were actually involved from the very beginning, from the design aspect 
through construction documents all the way through construction administration. And we were then able to uh, prove our talent. So I do understand, I think it's an important aspect for us to, for us to see how we can, can take that to, to the different level. And like, like I said before, the reason why I started my firm, I wanted to, to be that boss. And I was able to, my, my firm is very diverse. If you, if you come by our office, you will see that we have all um, different types of employees because they bring their, their cultural knowledge and, and additional viewpoints to a lot of the design aspects that we have. So I do, I do understand that we try to be as diverse as possible. And yeah, and not everybody luck out to work at a minority owned firm for the first, you know, once they got to college. So I think the ability to work at a firm where they are invested in minorities or in women and they, they want to, educate you they want to pay, they paying for exams or they they really motivating you to get your licensure that helps you to know that okay i am a value and that i can stay at this firm and i can move up and i think um having that not having that ability and to move up in a firm will i think better the firm because you you're there you know the culture and then your knowledge to get clients that maybe they can't get. So I understand you, Mel, when you're saying that, you know, that's why you started your own firm. But I, I just want to speak of the aspect of not everybody, you know, having that luxury of starting their own firm and working, you know, for a firm that's not a majority, minority, I'm not, not a minority. I think so, it all, absolutely. just quickly, I would like to say also about unconscious bias. So if your question is getting to like, what are the challenges of a lack of representation and how that negatively impacts firms. Aside from the lack of diversity and thought process of problem solving and values being brought to the table, there's also a recognition of unconscious biases that leadership might have in terms of identifying the next tier and the next realm of leaders and people that could be mentored and put in a position of power. Um, and it's, it's a, a bias that kind of plagues us all whether we think know it or not. Um, like I am more likely to walk into a room and hug a person of color that I'm meeting rather than shaking the hand of a male that I'll meet, right? And just kind of understanding like, oh, there's, there's a change of familiarity here because they're a reflection or closer to a reflection of what I feel comfortable next to or in or around. Um, but I think there needs to be a series of sensitivity training that we need to go through as a profession to understand that how those unconscious biases are limiting the opportunities that we're allowing for women and people of color in our firms. I also think that it's important to um, show your staff to your clients. Um, and what I mean by that is if you're, if you do have a diverse staff, then they should also be at the table when you are um, having client meetings. Um, you should also train them in how do you write proposals? How do you, um, put together fees? Like, what does all of this mean? And, um, I think that's all really important. Um, that was not a part of my training. Um, I did not. I did not really get that. So as a, I don't know if the men got it. Uh, maybe they did, and I, you know, just the women didn't get it um, in the firms I've worked for. But I think it's a really important thing to learn, regardless of if you're ever going to have your own firm. You should understand what that fee means and how did that come about. Um, you also should be at the table when you're getting when the firm's being criticized over what their work was or is, you know is or isn't. Um, I think that's also really important as well. Um, and so I think you know I think that if we're taking um, staff with us who are more diverse. I mean, I I have um, Keith and Nasreen couldn't couldn't do much without them. Um, but um, so I you know together we are I think we're really diverse and you know like where we come from and what we do. Um, at most a lot of times I won't even um, you know follow up with clients because they're already doing it. I think they're the important part of who we are. And even though Keith's got all this experience, it's still, you know, it's really good for like Nasreen as she's um, becoming um, more and more of an architect. I think it's, I think it's fantastic when you show those people. I want to say we have more. about three. Oh, okay. One minute. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Um, we can wrap it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, so seriously, like 
the studio culture that exists right now in systems of higher education, that mirrors studio culture, the future of studio culture for the future. If you're in your own studio within the system of higher education and you feel like you are unable to bring your voice forward, you're unable to share your, your values, you're unable to test literally your skills to be an architect because there's not, it's, it's whatever it is. No, normally, it's almost like an open playground, right? It's what you make of it to a degree. What Pascal was mentioning with um, the, almost like the, um, you, you, you said it much better than, than I can right now, but almost like an inherent bias or any, any type of like internal prejudice that you might already feel, um, given with all the complications that come with just being a student and being successful, having money and all that stuff. Seriously, it's so meaningful to recognize this as a student, whoever is uh, listening to this and taking something, at least of all the things to take away from this, um, when you're in school, that's when you are able to test the waters. And when there are opportunities to come forward and be in the know of these types of interventions that we're like, that the world is literally trying to show, I hope that there's an advocate for you. And if there isn't, then this is right now, you know what I mean? We are your advocates to get into the know of what's to come in the future and how you can be prepared for those things. That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, any, any last word? We're actually right on time, 710. So, if, but if there, right, if there aren't any uh, last, last words, I will turn it back over to Randy. I would like to say something. I think the um, overall message is if they don't see us, they don't want to be us. So I think we need to really show us show face in the community so try to make an effort of i know we're busy but try to make an effort to you know go to these schools with career day and join other organizations so i know for myself that's a challenge so I, i'm gonna challenge myself to do that go out in the community more and show my face and you know let them know that we're here you know come on over man you can come into our office <laughs> Also, you know, that's a great segue for people to say it loud. If you're a woman, yep. uh, BIPOC designer on this call or know of really talented uh, women in diverse designers, please encourage them to submit to Say It Loud Nevada. Um, because although it's virtual now, we are actually planning to have a physical exhibition next year. So this is the very beginning of it. And as you submit, we launch your work and put you to be elevated and celebrated. Um, really fun and amazing thing happened this week. Forbes contacted me and said they were perusing through the library and they gave me eight names that they wanted to get more information and contact information with. So this is really being a, a, a tool that's connecting and elevating us, which is powerful and important. And when you click the work, you are going to be like, holy crap, how did I not know? And, you know, people like Paul Reveal Williams, I did not know of his existence and his contributions until he won the AIA gold medal, which is crazy wow. that that's when he became in my purview. And Phil Freelon, when he passed away, people were like, who's Phil Freelon? Half of you looked at J. Max Bond Jr. and said, who's that? So understanding that we really need to document us. Um, and put us in a place where we're accessible to all is really important. So please do not be shy. You do not need to be the partner principal in charge to submit a project. You can be a student, a practicing designer, interiors, landscape, you name it. If you impact the built environment, please say it loud. I also provided links to my IG um, and ways to contact me. So please keep in touch. Um, and please keep elevating and stand with me um, every day. Thank you. Yeah, the, ED, the EDI committee will be in touch with you. <laughs> we certainly will, Pascal. Thank you so much. I, I can't begin to tell you how much yeah. this really means to us. It's, it's, uh, you, you're an inspiration for all of us. And um, I will say to all of our attendees, you know, the EDI committee is uh, ready. We, you can come and join us and, uh, and help us to achieve these goals and uh, help us to define what needs to be done. 
So I want to thank you all for, for being here, for participating and listening. And, um, you know, we're going forward from here with a new inspiration. So thank you again, Pascal, so much. Thanks, Pascal. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Pascal, thank you all. Stay thank well. You all. Stay well in those crazy times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Bye. Have Bye. a great night. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Bye night.